Hey out there Akronites, welcome once again to Around Akron with Blue Green. Now this episode is all about soil, rocks, and metal, and what people do with those things. On this episode, I'm going to meet up with an old time strongman. That's right, strongman. I travel over to Warren, Ohio to meet up with Rust Belt Rebirth and see what they're doing with recycled metal. I head over to Cuyahoga Falls and meet up with the Summit Lapidary Club and learn about turning rocks into jewelry. Now to kick this show off today, I'm going to meet up with Karen Edwards and talk all about the City Sprouts program. Let's go see what they're all about. Gardening is so intuitive to us as human beings. I mean, how long have we been doing it? So I've learned that soil is everything. Because I know what I know a lot from making mistakes. I grew up gardening, my dad always had big gardens, my mom you know, grew up on a farm. So I've always felt like I knew how to garden. But I learned a lot about soil and conditions of soil. But it's so easy. I mean, even if you just have buckets and you fill them with soil, you can put your pepper and tomato plants in there. And then you have access to salads. And those kind of things are expensive to buy. But they're so important for our health. Um, again, it's very intuitive for human beings and lots of resources for learning those kind of things. We have great organizations in Akron, of course, resources all over the web, but it's so much easier than people think it is. So much easier. And I want to encourage everyone to do it because it's health. It's just health in your backyard. I've been financially supported by the LeBron James Family Foundation for about eight years now, and that has enabled me to expand my program, expand our resources, get more children involved, get more families involved, spend more time with them, and for that I'm very grateful. City Sprouts is a children's gardening and sustainability program, which I consider to be a social justice movement, or part of the social justice movement, a social justice mission, because there's a lot of people who don't have access to all the resources that other people have access to. And one of the things that I like to do is help out parents. Parents are so busy these days. They don't really have time to teach these home skills to their kids, which are important. So we do a lot of growing organic produce. Health and wellness is everyone's birthright, but not everybody knows how to access that. So I like to say I'm just leading people to their own version of that. And I like to teach people how to grow organic produce, which is huge for your health and your finances. And mend your own clothes, can food, freeze food, make simple repairs so you don't have to call somebody else. That's a resource savings. Um, I do a lot of peace work with the kids. I think that any time that you have a functional family and you have peace in your home, that's a time saver. I think there's a lot of families that end up in situations that take up so much of their resources, their time and their energy and their resources. When teaching some coping skills, which I have been blessed to learn, is just really helpful to families. That's actually a resource savings. So let's say you have one chicken breast and five people to feed, but you have a garden full of produce. So now you have salads and stir fries. You don't have to run out to the store. You're getting the health benefits of having something directly, you know, you talk about locavore movement. It doesn't get more local than this for me. Um, and, and during the growing season, I eat out of this garden every day. In fact, I just made my own dinner out of this garden, made a huge salad because I would rather eat what I grow than go, you know, I'll spend December going to get produce. And that's a huge savings to a family. All those resources that can be saved, all the ways that you can stretch your dollars, any way that you can stretch your dollars. Um, you know, that buys school supplies, that buys new shoes. This is, um, it, it's helped me a lot and I know it'll help other people. I would love to expand to even more. Um, I would love to see other people do this. I document most of what I do on my social media accounts. 
so that if anybody wants to start this, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can just teach what I teach. I learned from other people. I didn't invent most of this, so it's great to offer those resources to people, small groups, neighborhood groups. This year, especially due to COVID, there's a lot of families who couldn't send their kids to summer camp. So I consulted with some parent groups and got them resources to have each family host a different night. And that's summer camp at the Joneses family house. And this is what we're doing on this night. This is what we're learning this night. And I think the more that that can happen in neighborhoods, the more that community gardening can come together in neighborhoods, community resource sharing, urban homesteading, all those things. That's what I would like to see. I would love to see us have an expansion of that kind of village life in Akron. I would say start somewhere. Just get one plant, just get, just nurture, even if it's a house plant. It's so intuitive to your spirit to keep something alive, to grow something close to you and keep it alive. And it's easier than you think. And then start something outside, get your friends involved, keep it watered. Water and sunshine is all you need. Next up, an old time strong man. That's right. What comes to mind when I say old time strong man? Is it a bald guy in a singlet with a handlebar mustache? Well, this guy's got a handlebar mustache and he is a strong man. Let's go see what Mark Burnett is all about. It is a good feeling. Uh, knowing that you're pitting yourself against something that for most people, it's not something that should bend. And then you do it it, it does feel good. Uh, you know, rolling up a, a frying pan nice and tight and, and hearing it, hearing the, the, the metal make noise as you're rolling it up is, yeah, there's a, there's a, uh, a nice, nice feeling with that. Seven years ago, last month, all summer long, I had a little voice in the back of my head saying, you need to learn how to bend steel. And I have no idea where it came from, but in August, I happened to be in Nashville, Tennessee for a workshop, and the gentleman that owned the facility, I knew he, had, he did some strongman. So at one point during the weekend, I went over and said, Dave, I've got this little voice, it won't go away. It says, I need to learn how to bend steel. And he just laughed, he's like, we can take care of that. So he sent me a video on how to bend a, a 60 penny timber tie. And told me that he was, wor he was working to get Dennis Rogers, who is arguably the most famous strong man in the last 30 years or so, uh, to do a workshop at his facility. Uh, so he set the date, I sent him my money and went down for a weekend of uh, learning how to bend the six, uh, the six basic feats, I guess you could say. Uh, bending short steel, which are 60 penny nails uh, or other steel, uh, bending horseshoes, tearing decks of cards, ripping phone books, driving a nail with your hand and bending longer steel. Now, we worked with four foot pieces of steel that day. And I was unsuccessful at bending short steel. And that was the first thing we did. And I thought, this is gonna be a really long weekend. Uh, and, but we got to the horseshoes, I cranked one right open. We got to the, everything else just came to me. First, there's some explanation that usually has to happen. It's like, I'm an old time strong man, well, what's that? Uh, you know, I've been, I've been metal with my hands. Uh, and a lot of times, I mean, I carry stuff in my car. So if, it, if it's handy, I'll go out and bring in a 60 penny nail and wrap it up and bend it for them. I, I drive a nail with my hand, either through a board or 
occasionally through an upside down frying pan and into and the board. Uh, I uh, bend short steel, I twist horseshoes into heart shapes, I tear decks of cards, I tear phone books, I bend wrenches, uh, I take a four foot piece of half inch round steel and bend it over my face. I break, uh, break chain with my chest by expanding my chest. Rolling up frying pans, that's always a that's, that's a crowd favorite, it seems like. <laughs> Realistically, what I've, I think what I've learned the most is that, I mean, everyone, granted, I do things that people don't do, but they could. I'm not some superhuman, I'm not special. I do consistent practice. I work on my mindset, I focus, and this is something I'm, I enjoy doing. I, I really enjoy it and I, I enjoy performing for a group as well. So the mindset, you know, you've got to watch what you say to yourself. You've got to, your negative talk, and everybody has it. Everybody talks, of, you know, it's, it's that inner dialogue that you've got to learn to get a handle on and start nipping in the bud because everybody, every human out there has far more capacity inside them than they will ever, ever tap into. You've got the power within you, be it strength-wise or any other thing you want to pursue, you just have to learn to let it out. You have to get out of your own way and allow it to come out. And that is probably the biggest lesson I've learned. Yes, consistency and, and practicing something, not just going through the motions, but put your mind into it, regardless of what it is. Pay attention to what you're doing. Don't just go through the motions. Conscious practice, consistent practice, uh, again, if you've got if you if you have a passion for it, it's going to be easier to get past those plateaus that everyone hits, and uh, a focus on what you're doing will take you farther than than you can imagine. For the next segment, I took a trip over to Warren, Ohio, to meet up with some guys that take recycled metal and turn it into beautiful furniture. Let's go see what Rust Belt Rebirth is all about. When I told my mom I was going to welding school, she said, are you going so you can make art or so you can make money? <laughs> and it's the only way I've made money for the past 10, 12 years. I went through the, through the Job Corps program. It's a government-sponsored program. It, it was a Kennedy program that was started. It's federally funded, and they actually pay you to go to school. So while you're staying there on their campus and you're being fed the food in their cafeteria, they're also throwing money into an account so when you get out, you can push off and you can do your thing. So it was, uh, it was the perfect thing for somebody like me that came out of high school wanting to go to art school. I couldn't afford it. I got tired of working all these crappy jobs and then this Job Corps thing came up and, uh, and it was just like the perfect chance. It gave me a chance and, uh, and I went with it. Father, he was a fabricator, boilermaker, welder, ship builder. I never got into it. I was split family. Uh, so it was just something that I never endeavored in. However, uh, I painted a lot. I drew a lot. As, since I could hold a crayon, my grandfather, he was a painter. And uh, he painted for the Pitcairns out of uh, Philadelphia and so forth. And. Uh, I guess that gene stuck with us. My dad, he was pretty talented, David Hyde, and uh, he's done some incredible work as well. But uh, as far as me with the metal, not too much. Until, up, just up until I met Doug. I 
I didn't start off tr trying to create green furniture. It was more out of, um, out of necessity for material. Uh, and I didn't know where to buy metal from, so I would just go curb for anything that was metal on the curb. So, you know, bicycles, shopping carts, wheelchairs, all that stuff would get chopped up and turned into something. And it sort of started from there and evolved into what it is now. So, you know, all that earlier work was sort of like shopping cart chaise lounges, wheelchair couches, you know, bicycle tables and bars and stuff. And uh, it got to a point where it was starting to get hard to find things if people wanted them. So I knew I had to transition into something that I could use continually. And then I came up with this patchworking idea for materials. I start out with what they call an armature. And it's basically the skeleton of the the uh, piece. It, it starts out with uh, drawings of the actual anatomy so I can get the bone structure, the, the, the actual shape and form. And then uh, with using the other tools that are available, uh, right behind there is a shaper, basically a plenishing hammer that we use that shapes round edges and so forth like that. Then we uh, hand hammer it you know, either on a plate steel or whatnot, uh, cut it in different forms, fashions, and stuff like that. Um, Nelson Ledges Quarry Park, uh, not too far from here, had uh, commissioned me to make a memorial for a dog of the owner, a uh, life-size statue, or close to a life-size statue, of the owner's dog that had died almost a year ago to this date. And uh, it's been several months I've been working on this. They went the other side is going to be a time capsule um, and it's going to be permanently installed at the park to greet the visitors there. Um, I've always been a fan of um, folk art environments. So, um, you know, like um, maybe like a, a playground themed sculpture garden would be right up my alley. That would be something I would love to do. Something that's interactive, the kids can play on, yet it's a work of art and everyone can, it's not, you know, closed access or anything. A lot larger pieces, uh, garden pieces as, as well as what Doug had mentioned. We've always had a dream of actually having a, a sculpture fest. We have enough uh, land on our property that we can uh, invite other artists to join in to that element. Well, that's the poverty trap is, yeah, you can afford cheap furniture, but you're gonna be buying that same piece of furniture every couple of years. And it's hard to come up with the initial amount of money to buy that thing that you know you're gonna have all the time. A lot of my customers end up being people that are finally replacing their IKEA furniture, or uh, you know, or they want something that's heirloom quality, and it, oftentimes it's an impulse buy. Like they don't, they see the stuff and then they want it. They had no clue that they were going to show up and buy it, but um, you know, and that's kind of like, you know, part of part of the mojo of the process is creating something that people will want, something they've never seen before, and uh, you know, peeling back the layer of, that layer of, you know, uh, you know, I wanna call it like the cosmic imagination a little bit, you know, creating something that new that's never been there before, something that's been there but is recreated in a different way that people haven't seen it this way before. Um, so really just kind of transferring inspiration in that sense. Now to wrap this show up today, I'm gonna to meet with Summit Lapidary Club. They're an organization that loves rocks and more importantly, they love turning rocks into gems into something beautiful. Let's go see what Summit Lapidary is all about. It's a human nature to collect things and want to show them. So another thing that's really fun about this group of people is it's always show and tell, always show and tell. And in second grade, that was my favorite part of the week, show and tell. You wanna show something, and you want to tell about it. So there's a lot of storytelling and there's 
someone's always making something or inventing something or bringing something in to share and everybody's been very generous as well. It's uh, actually two different groups make up our, our complete club. Um, the one is Akron Mineral and they um, mostly deal with just the collecting and appreciating just the rocks in their original form. Now the other club, our Summit Lavendary Club, is meet, we meet the first Tuesday of every month. And we again, we've just started meeting, September was our first one, but we are meeting with a Zoom platform. So we're just having virtual meetings at this time. The main gist of our Summit Lavendary Club would be teaching. And the whole idea behind it is teaching and learning lapidary skills. So we have like to have classes to teach people how to do silver making, cab making, wire wrapping, casting, pounding. <laughs> So the members of the club have so much knowledge all together that it's really fun whenever we go to the club meetings or whenever we're just conversing at a field trip or in some regard. Everybody has different backgrounds and different knowledge and different interests and so you just start a conversation and you get that encyclopedic knowledge from 50 years of learning about rocks on their own. And so it's been really fun for me as one of the younger members to come in and have this knowledge base, just like, hey, here it is. And you can tap, and everyone's so friendly, you can just tap into knowledge, whatever you're looking into, you know? It's been fun. We do have the upstairs, um, is mostly displays going down the two sides of, um, it's all collections that have been brought in by the members over the years. That area can be used for teaching classes. We have a, uh, couple of the heavier things that we can't move around easily like a rolling mill and and things that we use on this floor. The first floor, the basement, also has a lot of saws and slab saws and grinding equipment. I've gone on a couple trips with the club to a place called Flint Ridge which is just outside of Columbus, Ohio and I've been able to source the stone from a mine, which is really just like someone's backyard with a hole dug and they happen to have flint deposits on their property and they've opened it up to people to come and pay to mine the rock. And so I've really appreciated maybe the last three years working with Ohio Flint, which is very colorful, very diverse, and it comes in smaller chunks, depending on how you source it and what you pick at the location. And so there is some quartz that is incorporated in the flint. So whenever geologically, whenever the earth cracks, it heals itself in quartz in this particular area. And so you have flint, but then if anything shifted or if there was any type of pocket of gas or some type of shift, over time it heals itself with quartz crystals. And so I really appreciate those veins or those pockets where you would see like a druzy. And so if you're there on a lucky day when there's sunshine, you might be able to see a little sparkle or a little glitz. Ohio Flint is the gemstone of Ohio. Like the cardinal, the red bird is Ohio State Cardinal. Ohio Flint is the gemstone. Yeah, and one really cool property of Flint that another mineral that I know of, quartz has. It, it has piezoelectric capabilities and so like Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts if you would you know put flint together or you're trying to start a fire you would rub it together and it would create a reaction where you could create a spark where not all rocks do that. Quartz and flint have that piezoelectric capability which I think is really cool. I have enjoyed learning how to work with rock and I've recognized that by being an artist and appreciating one set of skills and how to make jewelry with metal is one thing, how to make jewelry with rocks is another thing and it's a whole nother level of learning 
and then like how to set stones or how to facet stones is a whole nother set of knowledge and a whole nother set of tools. And so there's kind of a joke, hey, you're always gonna need another tool. There's always another tool that you need. There's always something more to learn. There's always a new technique to learn. And that's why it's been really nice to have this club is because there are so many diverse individuals who have background knowledge, professional background knowledge and hobby background knowledge that you can tap into when you're seeking to learn about this new technique. Thank you once again for watching this episode of Around Akron with Blue Green. Now, if you have any questions or any comments, you just want to drop me an email, you can reach me at www.aroundakronwithbluegreen.com or you can catch me on Facebook and on Instagram. Thank you and have an amazing day. I make a trip down, well over actually. I make a trip over to Warren, Ohio to meet up with Rust Birth, Rust Birth, Rust Belt Rebirth. Rust Birth Rebelts. Rust Birth Rebelts. <laughs> it's all about it. <laughs> okay. I travel over to Warren, Ohio to meet up with Rust Birth, eh, Rust Birth.